Hello and welcome to C Star Algebras from a Novice Perspective. And this is a video series I've decided to do because I'm still learning about C Star Algebras and when I started learning about this topic I found there to be, well, not that much coverage on this topic on YouTube, or at least not very much good, good coverage. So you got these very basic introductions, but you didn't really get into the meat of the theory and these really interesting results. And that's what I'd like to contribute with. And uh, I also think that if I do this, then I will learn this material even better than I already know it. So for me, it's really killing two birds with one stone. So yeah, let's just get straight into C star algebras from, an, from a novice perspective. An introduction today. So first off, let's go over the definitions. So we begin with Banach algebras. So a Banach algebra is simply an algebra which has some norm which we denote in this way, which is complete with respect to this norm. And that means that if you have a Cauchy sequence in the algebra, then that Cauchy sequence should converge in the algebra. And then we have that this norm satisfies the Banach inequality, which we have here, which simply states that if you have the norm of the product AB, then that is less than or equal to the norm of A times the norm of B. And this is sort of the characteristic Banach inequality. And the final note on these Banach algebras is that we only consider complex Banach algebras, which are Banach algebras over the field of complex numbers. Of course, you can talk about real ones as well, but we're only going to consider complex ones. Now, a star algebra is an algebra which has a unary operator, which we call the star operator. And this star operator is an involution, which means that if you apply the star twice, then you get back what you started right here. So if you take the star of a star, then that is just equal to a. And this star operator should be conjugate linear as well. So if you take lambda a plus b, where lambda is some complex number, then this star of this entire sum should just be equal to the complex conjugate of lambda times a star plus b star, which we have here. And finally, we want this star operator to be an anti-homomorphism. And what that means is simply that it reverses the order of operations so, or the order of multiplication. So if you have the star, star of A times B, then that should be the star of B times the star of A. So we have here that it reverses the order of multiplication on the algebra. And once we have a Banach star algebra, it will be a C star algebra if the norm that we have satisfies this special condition over here, which is called the C star condition. So the norm of A star times A should be equal to the norm of A squared. Now, at the first uh, point, this might seem a bit strange or arbitrary. Why is this sort of an important condition to study? Well, as it turns out, many important Banach star algebras actually have this kind of C star algebra structure. So from that point alone, alone it's worth at least investigating what can be said about these Banach algebras in general with this C star condition in play. And it's also the case that the C star condition is way less innocuous than it seems. So you get a lot of interesting and maybe even unexpected structure from having this simple condition on the Banach norm that the C star condition is. And once you have this C star condition, you can really start developing a very rich theory, which really makes C star algebras a very powerful concepts in mathematics. So let's go over some basic examples of C star algebras. And the first example is, of course, the trivial one, which is the C star algebra that is the complex plane, because complex numbers are a C star algebra. It's pretty simple. So you take the norm to be the absolute value of a complex number, very simple. 
And then you take the star operator to be complex conjugation. And it's very simple to check that this is actually a C-star algebra. And now the product here between complex numbers, of course, that's a commutative product. So you don't really see this star operator switch the order of multiplication because the order doesn't matter here, but it really, it is a C-star algebra. And generally speaking, C-star algebra can be seen as the way to generalize the set of complex numbers. And if we go even more, even more generally, of course, Banach star algebras are also a way to generalize the complex numbers. But it's when we have the C star property, when we really can get a theory and we can get structure on these C star algebras that is really closely tied to this structure of the complex plane. And we will see this in these lectures going forward. So the next important class of examples is that of the locally compact spaces. So let X be a locally compact and Hausdorff space. And let C naught of X denote the continuous functions on X that vanish at infinity. Then C naught of X is a C star algebra. And here we take the multiplication to be pointwise multiplication of functions, which is a commutative operation. And we take the star operator to be complex conjugation pointwise. And finally, we take the norm to be the supremum norm, which is simply the supremum taken all over the entire space of the absolute value of f of x. And this norm works well because we only consider continuous functions which vanish at infinity. Otherwise, we might have some problems. But in this particular case, we don't have any issues whatsoever. Now, there is one interesting thing to note about this example, and that is that the complex plane that we looked at in the previous slide is actually isomorphic to C0 of x if x is a one-point space. And this can be seen quite easily if you take any function defined only on one, a one-point set, then each function can be uniquely identified with the complex value it takes at the point. So, so this is not really strange, but more generally, this is not a coincidence that C, which is a commutative C star algebra, is in fact isomorphic to C not of X for some locally compact house or space. This is not at all a strange coincidence. But let's move on to a more interesting example, less easy to understand, which is that of the matrices. So we have this set of complex n by n matrices. And this set is, once again, a C star algebra. And we have the multiplication simply to be the regular matrix multiplication, which is a non commutative multiplication. And we have the star operator to be the Hermitian conjugate, which we denote by the stagger symbol here. And of course, if you've read any linear algebra, you know that the star of a times b is simply b star or times a star, or I should maybe should say the dagger of a times b is equal to b dagger times a dagger. And finally, the norm we use is the operator norm, which is simply that the operator norm of a is equal to the supremum taken over all vectors x which have norm less than or equal to one. And then we take the, the supremum of the norm of A times X, where the norm of CN is simply the standard norm given by the inner product. Now, one proves that this norm is really a C-star norm by using this highlighted identity, which I have here. And we use it together with the cauchy schwarz inequality. So let's go over why this highlighted identity is actually true. So we prove it pretty simply using the cauchy schwarz inequality, actually. So it simply states that if we have the absolute value of a scalar product between x and y, then that is always less than or equal to the norm of x times the norm of y, where these norms are just the induced norm from the scalar product. And also, this is an equality 
right here, if x and y are parallel. Now, if we assume that A is a non-zero matrix, then we take x to be a unit vector such that the norm of Ax is simply the operator norm of A as we defined it earlier. And this is possible to do if we have a finite dimensional vector space. If we have infinite dimensions, this might be a bit trickier. But if we have a finite dimensional vector space, then we can always find such a vector that maximizes this uh, norm here. And then we see that for any unit vector y, we have that the cauchy schwarz inequality yields that the absolute value of this scalar product here is less than or equal to the norm of ax times the norm of y. And the norm of y is 1, and the norm of ax is simply the operator norm of a. And we see that this is actually an equality if y is chosen to be this particular vector here, so it's ax over the operator norm of a because then y has norm 1, and this scalar product is just equal to the operator norm of A. Simple stuff, really. So we have from this previous slide that this highlighted identity really is true. And when we have that, we can pretty easily show that this norm that we have on the matrix algebra is the C-star norm. So first off, let x and y be unit vectors then we can use this very particular property of uh, the Hermitian conjugate. So if we have a scalar product of a star a times x, and then we take the scalar product of this with y, then we can move the Hermitian conjugate over to the other side. So a star becomes a here on the other side. So really this scalar product here is equal to this scalar product over here. And by the cauchy schwarz inequality, this is less than or equal to the norm of Ax times the norm of Ay, which is, of course, less than or equal to the operator norm of A squared. Now, this is an equality, once again, if x is equal to y, and if x is chosen such that the norm of Ax and the norm of Ay, of course, then becomes equal to the operator norm of A. And that's it. We have proven that this matrix algebra with this particular norm that we chose is in fact a C-star algebra. That we have here. Just as we want it. Now, we can generalize this matrix example quite a bit. So, if we look at operators on a Hilbert space, so let B of H denote the set of bounded operators on a Hilbert space, then this set is a C-star algebra by basically analogous logic to the matrix example. So multiplication is just composition of operators, and the star operator is given by this inner product on H. So this is sort of an identity here that the scalar product of A, X, and Y is equal to x times a star y for all x and y in the Hilbert space. There is one unique operator a star which corresponds to each a like this. And that is sort of a theorem that you have to know about, but it is the case that this there is a, a way to define the star operator using the inner product. And then of course we take the operator norm of a like we did for the matrices. And we just use the cauchy schwarz inequality once again, because the cauchy schwarz inequality holds for any Hilbert space. So then one can prove that this norm is a C-star norm in pretty much the same way as we did with the matrix example. Now, are there other interesting examples that we need to consider? Not really. In fact, the examples that I listed are kind of the only ones that you can make up. And that is the content of this fundamental theorem, that every C-star algebra A is isomorphic to a C-star subalgebra of the bounded operators for some Hilbert space H. In particular, if A is a commutative C-star algebra, then A is isomorphic to C-naught of X 
for some locally compact Hausdorff space, X. And this is really the core goal of this video series. I want to explain why this is true. Because if you don't know why this is true, then you don't really have a lot to go on when it comes to Caesar algebras. So this is what I want to get it at at the end of the day. And of course, even if you learned all the theory up to this point, there is so much more to go over. But as I said, this is going to be an introductory course. So really, we're going to try to get here and then we'll see whether we want to go farther beyond uh, that point afterwards. It depends on how long it actually takes. So let's just look at sort of the outline for this course, what I'm thinking right now. So first off, in this video, I wanted to go over some introduction and important examples, which we have done. Now I may go over some more examples that are interesting to highlight. Maybe not Caesar algebras, but maybe something else. I don't know. We'll see. And then once I have that, I want to go over some basic prerequisites for Banach star algebras, which are going to be important for us. And I'm also going to, going to go over some basic prerequisites for, say, the spectral theory for operators. But it's going, going to be a, quite a brief thing. It's not going to be a deep dive. And once we have these prerequisites in place, we can start talking about the commutative Gelfand theory for Banach star algebras, which will lead us to fundamental results about commutative C star algebras. And this in turn will lead us to a powerful tool called uh, the functional calculus for normal operators, which will enable us to talk about positive elements and what this entails. And finally, we're going to talk about representations of C star algebra algebras, which finally will lead us to the GNS construction, which is the main tool to prove the Gelfand Nijmark theorem. Now, as you may have noticed, I expect some basic familiarity with some of the following topics that I list down here. So first off, I expect you to know a few things about topology. For instance, I expect you to know what a topology is. I expect you to know what different topologies on a given space are, or ex at least some examples. And when it comes to functional analysis, I expect you to know some things about convergence, duals, some of the central theorems, say the open mapping theorems, and uh, stuff like that. Really, these fundamental theorems, I expect you to at least have heard about them and know kind of the gist of what they mean. And then I also expect you to know some operator theory, or at least have heard some of it, say that you have some spectral theory for operators, and you know kind of what the difference is between the spectral theory for matrices and the spectral theory for general operators. So yeah, some of the basics. And then finally, some abstract algebra. I expect you to know what a homomorphism is. I expect you to know what an ideal is and what a quotient is. Now, of course, I don't expect you to know all about all of these topics, because there is a lot to learn about all of these topics, of course. But I ex expect you to know some of the basics and maybe more be familiar with the terminology being used. Otherwise, you will struggle with this course. And that is something I can guarantee. And finally, I would like to give you some references. So first off, my main reference that I've used when I read on Caesar Algebras is actually this book called Caesar Algebras by Example by Davidson from 1996. And I think that's a pretty good one. Uh, sort of as an introductory text to Caesar algebras, because the author writes from the perspective of someone who doesn't really know very much about Caesar algebras coming into it. So it's a very good introductory course on Caesar algebras. Now, I dislike some of the notation and some of the conventions that he uses in the book. So I will change a few things. But in general, I will try to follow the the outline of that book kind of closely, but not one to one, maybe. And then I have this supplementary book, which is the operator algebra book by a Blackadar. Now there are some versions of that. I have the, the 2013 
edition, but there are many editions out there. And this book is really more of a reference book, so it really gives more meat on the bone on this sea star theory than maybe the, the Davidson book. But it's not really written as sort of an a book that is meant to teach you about sea star algebras if you don't know stuff already, but it's more like a reference book that contains all the important theory. And then finally, say that you can't get a hold of, the, of these books or something like that, then I've listed one set of online lecture notes. Of course you can find more, but these are the notes I found just doing a quick Google search and I looked through them. They seem to be fine. So you can do a lot of reading on your own, but um, I hope that I can give a lot of value with these kinds of lectures going forward. And I think that's it for this first lecture. See you later.